All right, what's up, Ground Bible Chapel? Welcome, my name is Zach. I'm one of the pastors here. So grateful that you were joining us here this morning. If you are new, again, we're glad that you're here. We'd love the opportunity to connect with you. Uh, and to do that, there's gonna be a number that pops up on the screen. You can text CONNECT to 860-753-3353. That'll stay up there for a little while. Again, in a time such as this, people are, are still plugging into the life of the church. We would love to invite you to do that so that we can get to know you a little bit better. Now, two things. Prayer is really important, right? And a living church is a praying church. So before we get into the word, I want to share with you real quick two things that we're doing around this idea of prayer, right? Because prayer is important. First off, every Friday we send out a GBC family prayer. Now, if you are subscribed, you can go to the bottom of the website, click subscribe. You will get three emails a week. The Friday email is our family prayer. That's written in the first person. It's designed for you to be able with friends or family or by yourself to just pray out loud amongst other believers, knowing that there's hundreds of people praying that prayer. We pray for the church. We pray for something in the community specific and something a nation specifically. And starting this week, we're actually going to be including prayers from GBCers, right? So people are writing them, people are praying them, doing this as a family. Second, starting the first Tuesday of every month, starting in June, so June 2nd, we are participating in 24-hour prayer with churches from all over New England, and we are owning the 24 hours of the first Tuesday of every month. And so this Friday, when we send out our prayer email, there's gonna be a button to sign up. We would love to get people in 15 minute chunks to own that entire 24 hour period so that as a church, New England churches are praying and praying and praying together, covering the ministry in our area as we endure this time together. And we're really excited about that. So right now we are gonna dive into the word. We actually have some people who are gonna read the word for us and then we will be right back. John 10, 31 through 42. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said, I am God's son? Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I am doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. This way you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Then they were trying again to seize him, but he eluded their grasp. He went beyond the Jordan River, near the place where John was first baptizing, and stayed there a while, and many followed him. John did not perform miraculous signs. They remarked to one another, but everything he said about this man has come true, and who were there believed in Jesus. Awesome. Thank you to those people who read the word for us. Appreciate Jeremy kind of gathering some of his youth to read from the scriptures for us this week. Today we're in John chapter 10, continuing to look at the life of Jesus through the biography of, of someone who knew him really well, right, John. And so we're going to be in John chapter 10. You can open up your Bibles. Verse 31 is where we are going to be. And so you can kind of Go into the last quarter of the scriptures, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 10, verse 31. Before I read, I want to share something. We, uh, this week was kind of a milestone in my life, all right? This week, for the very first time, I made a mortgage payment. Now, I paid rent before, right? But my wife and I, we just bought a house. And so I went to the bank and it's, I got the mortgage from a bank where we don't actually bank, right? So, so we, I went to the bank, the drive through because they're closed right now. And I had to drop off the check. And so I pull up to kind of the counter thing where you're interacting with the person. And I get there. And in order to give them my money, because I brought the payment, right? Of course, what do they do? They ask me for my ID. Now, being the irresponsible person I was on that particular day, apparently, I didn't have my ID. 
And so uh, we ended up interacting a little bit and verifying who I was, which I thought was interesting because I'm just trying to give them money, right? But they needed my ID in order to do so. And so eventually we got it worked out. I was able to make the payment and it just made me, made me realize that all of us, perhaps you've been in situations where you get to a place and you show up and you don't have your ID, all right? Or maybe you're making a call, right? And you don't have the account number or something and they do whatever they can to verify who you are. Maybe it's ask certain kinds of questions, right? What's your mother's maiden name? That used to be a security question. If your mom posts her maiden name on Facebook, that is not a good question to ask, okay? But whatever the security question might be. And so we get in these kinds of situations. You show up, you need something, you have to verify who you are, we get into the text today with Jesus. He's having an exchange with some of the Jewish leaders. And what they're doing is they want to verify who he is. And he doesn't have an ID card that he can give to them, right? But instead of pointing to his mother's maiden name or the name of his first pet or the, the mascot of his high school, right? They're not asking those sorts of questions. He says, look at my works. Look at what I've done as a verification for who he is. And there's a wrestling with that. And so today we're gonna dive into this text and we're gonna look what exactly is Jesus saying and what are people struggling with as he's saying it. So you can pick up your Bible. We're gonna be in John chapter 10. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the background, then we're gonna uh, look at the rebuttal, Jesus's rebuttal. This is kind of the order. We're gonna look at background, blasphemy and stoning. Like, okay, what's going on there? Then Jesus has a rebuttal where he drops this, this thing like, well, those people were called gods. What, what in the world? We're gonna talk about that. And then we're gonna end with kind of the meat of it, looking at the consistency of God and what Jesus has to say about himself. So first, let's read. Start verse 31. He says, again, the Jews picked up rocks to stone him. Jesus replied, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these works are you stoning me? We aren't stoning you for a good work, the Jews answered, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Now, two things, we're gonna kind of rush through these first two sections, the background, right? Two things that we see here is that one, uh, uh, the Jews are getting Jesus for this thing called blasphemy. And there were two main categories of blasphemy. On the one hand, it was cursing God. And on the other hand, it was falsely representing God, right? And so they were kind of getting him more on that second thing, that he was falsely representing God because he himself had said, made himself out to be the son of God. And if you go back, well, why in the world is that a crime? If you go back in time and you look at Leviticus, right, which is where many Bible reading plans go to die, you go to Leviticus, and the whole point of Leviticus is that God had gifted his people the law. He had gifted them the law to give them a mechanism for his, him, himself dwelling in their midst. That this perfect, holy, all right, spotless, infinite, eternal God would actually dwell in the midst of this broken, sinful, messed up, baggage-carrying people. And so God gives them the law. And, and, and within the midst of the law, one of the things is blasphemy. Some of you may know this today as slander or libel. In fact, many states, and you can sue someone, right, for slander civilly in, in every state. You can actually be uh, uh, prosecuted criminally in some states for slander, right? Saying something false about the, uh, uh, falsely slandering the reputation of someone else. That's some part of our legal system today. And so when God was in the midst of the people, one of the things, one of the crimes, blasphemy, right, speaking out against, falsely about the name of God, and it was punishable. Again, holy, perfect God in the midst of a broken and baggage-carrying people. And so, so that, that's, that's kind of the, the backdrop. The, the punishment of the day, the punishment of the time happened to be stoning. And so these people seeing Jesus, they're picking up rocks. Why? Because in, the, in Israel at the time and still today, there were lots of rocks. I looked this up and historians were talking about how it was the preferred punishment because there were simply so many rocks. They were easy to come by. 
And so you would you'd pick up your stones. And so you imagine this scene, these people looking at Jesus, falsely representing God in their minds, right? And they're grabbing stones and they're armed and they're ready to go. Because in their minds, Jesus has been blaspheming the name of God, falsely representing God. And so Jesus responds, Jesus kind of cuts them off and he does so with a really interesting rebuttal, all right? And this is often a little confusing for people, right? And so we're gonna walk through it. Verses 34 through 36, Jesus answered them, isn't it written in your law? I said, you are gods. Whoa, wait a second. We're talking to people, we're talking to Israel. You are God. Who's he? Who's it? We'll get there. If he called those whom the word of God came to gods, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say you are blaspheming to the one the Father set apart and sent into the world? Because I said, I am the Son of God. Now, you may have to read that like three or four or ten times, right, to understand kind of the syntax of what's going on here. It's slightly confusing. And so we're gonna try to iron that out a little bit. But what Jesus here is quoting Psalm 82. All right, so we're gonna actually read the Psalm. He's quoting Psalm 82, verse six. I'm gonna read it verse five through eight and tell you what in the world he's saying about himself. Psalm 82, verse five. They do not know or understand. Boom, it's right there, I wanted to make sure. Uh, they wander in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the most high. However, you will die like humans and fall like any other ruler. Rise up, God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. Now, what we have here in Psalm 82, right, is what many uh, postulate is, is referring to the rulers or the judges of Israel, perhaps Israel in their entirety, but speaking to them, right? The, the word being used here is in the Hebrew, Elohim. Elohim. Now you look Elohim up, Elohim can refer to God, right? The God, Yahweh Elohim, or it can refer to God's broadly in Hebrew. But one of the other kind of definitions you look in a Hebrew lexicon is it can refer to judges or authorities. In the same way in English, right, where you have kind of uppercase uh, G-O-D and then you have the lowercase gods. And so Jesus is doing here what some commentators call a delay or a distraction technique, right? Because he's referring back to this. The Pharisees are up in his face saying, you're calling yourself the son of God, Right? We're gonna take you out because you're blaspheming. You're calling yourself the son of God. And Jesus will pause, whoa, 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 wait a second. You are going to kill me for calling myself the son of God, right? I'm the one consecrated by God, set apart on a mission, sent by God. That's me, I'm, that, that's who I am. You're gonna kill me for calling me the son of God when in your law, back in the day, the, 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 the evil rulers were addressed all right, as Elohim, little g God. Jesus isn't saying that those rulers were gods, right? He's picking up on wordplay. He's picking up on the reality that, that that word was used for them. How much more so, how much more so should it be able to be used of him, the one consecrated, set apart, sent by God, right? And again, some commentators call this a delay or a distract, kind of a delay tactic, right? Because they're armed and he's trying to just use what he's got to kind of calm them down a little bit, get them to put down the rocks so he can keep pushing forward. And that's exactly what he does next. And, and the irony in all of this, right, is that they're attacking Jesus for blaspheming when the truth of the matter is they're the ones blaspheming because they are trying to take out God. And so you have this rebuttal, right? One, we saw the background. Two, Jesus offers this rebuttal. And then three, Jesus is just gonna continue pushing forward. And this is where he lays down what I think is the meat of our passage today. Let me get back to John. Verse 37. Here we go. They're, they wanna take him out. They wanna kill him. And Jesus, Jesus keeps pushing back. He is just, he, he, he's, he's, he's dropping truth bombs. If I am not doing my father's work, don't believe me. Remember I talked about 
all right, validating who he was. If I'm not doing the Father's work, don't believe me. But if I am doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. This way you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Then they were trying again to seize him, but he eluded their grasp. Again, if I am doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. That Jesus could actually point to what he's doing and say, that's who I am, All right? What we see here, right, is a statement about the consistency of God. This is what we're gonna explore now for the remainder of the sermon, that Jesus can point to what he's been doing and actually say, look at what I'm doing, that's who I am. And it gets at this truth about the God that we worship, that he is what he does and he does what he is, that our God is perfectly and unceasingly consistent in everything, in word and in action, that he is what he does and he does what he is. You think about that for a second, what it means to say that, that he's perfectly consistent. It is impossible for God to do something outside of his nature, outside of his character, right? It's different for you and me. It's very, very different. You and me, we look at the way that we act, right? That who we are, for better or for worse, depending on the situation, who we are and what we do, very different at times. That kind of intuitively, we seek the kind of consistency, right? But sometimes we get to rest in that fact. Sometimes we get to be encouraged by the fact that the things that we do don't define who we are. That for, if you're a child of God, if you believe in who Jesus is and you've been kind of cloaked in his righteousness and the Holy Spirit is sanctifying you, that at times you will mess up, at the times you may fall away, at times you may just struggle, but the mistakes don't actually define you. You're defined by who you put your trust in. And that can be encouraging, right? That you aren't what you do. But still, nonetheless, many of you have grown up in homes in which people, in which parents or whoever will connect what you do and who you are. Hey, you're a Smith. This is how Smiths behave. Hey, you're a Stevens. Stevens don't do that, right? Hey, you're a Jones. And in this household, we blank, connecting who we are, what we do. Now, just this past week, one second, I was checking something. Just this past week, we were uh, playing with the kids and my boys are in kind of a, a costume phase. It, probably, it seems never ending at this point, but my older son was dressed as Batman, right? So he had this foam kind of Batman muscles on the front. My wife uh, made him a little tool belt that he wrapped around yeah, out of cardboard. We, we uh, colored black, some batarangs for his belt, uh, took some paper and made a mask with rubber bands. Good old, and he's, he's dressed up as Batman. My two-year-old sees him and he wants to be a part of the fun, right? And so he gets an old Superman costume that we have and we got a red blanket. We tie it around, it's a cape. So now they're being Superman. And of course, my wife and I, we look over and we see our two-year-old and he's got his finger so far up his nose, right? Like this dude isn't picking something. He's full on excavating his sinuses, right? And so my wife, she looks over and she says, Sai, Superman doesn't pick his nose. And he kind of looked at her. And he's like, Sai, Superman doesn't pick his nose. The connection, right, between who you are what you do, Jesus can look at the actions of God, the work of God, and say perfectly that that is who I am because God is what he does and does what he is. And so what I wanna do right now is I wanna walk through four things. We could do dozens. I wanna walk through four things, all right, about Jesus where we can see God in action and we can see the consistency of God in the person and in the work of of Jesus, right? We're gonna start there. Number one, creator. God is a creator. You go back all the way to the beginning in Genesis, in the beginning, God, right? That before anything else was God, you could divide all of creation as creator and created. Richard Bauckham, historian in the UK, has done a lot of great work showing that, that the, the Jewish conception of God during this time really delineated him from all other spiritual beings as the one who created everything else and as the one worthy of worship, right? Creator. You may have seen the, the movie Noah that came out a few years ago. 
terrible movie in so many ways, but there were two things I really loved about it, right? And as an aside, I'll say, when, when Hollywood makes a movie about a Bible story, generally it's gonna be bad, but they're amazing evangelism opportunities. If you tell a friend like, hey, I'll buy your ticket, you just gotta eat dinner with me afterwards and talk about it, right? Because we go and talk about the Bible and everything the movie got wrong. One of the things the movie got, got really was insightful was when everyone in the film referred to God as creator. Because before then, God hadn't revealed himself to Abraham, hadn't revealed himself to Moses. We have this thing in scripture, this, this doctrine, we call it progressive revelation, that over time, God reveals himself more and more to his people, like in any relationship, friendship, romantic, whatever, that over time, you reveal more and more of who you are. God does the same thing. And in the beginning, it was creator. He was known as creator and everything else was created, that our God is a creator. Well, when Jesus shows up on the scene and he starts ministry, what's the very first thing he does? What's the very first miracle he does? It's a creative act. He takes water at a party and he creates wine. A creative act. He's on a hill later with thousands of people and they're hungry and they gotta feed them all. And they get a couple loaves of bread and some fish and what does he do? He creates food for thousands, a creator. Jesus can look at those works. He can look at the works of God, the power of God, right? He can look at those and he can say, it's who I am. Our God is what he does and does what he is. He is perfectly and unceasingly consistent. And Jesus can say, that's who I am. Next is healer. Our God is a healer. Throughout the Old Testament, we see this come out in the way that people approach God. I have a couple, just a couple scriptures here in Jeremiah 17, 14. Jeremiah's plea, it says, heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved, for you are my praise. In Psalm 30, verse two, Lord, my God, I cry to you for help and you healed me. You can go on and on. That deeply within the, 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 the heart, the character, the nature of a restoration seeking God, right, is a healer. And we, what do you see in the ministry of Jesus? He shows up and he's healing people. The lame can walk, the blind can see, the mute can speak. Not only that, he comes up to people with diseases. He comes up to people with lepers, right? Normally, you come up to someone with a contagious disease, and what happens? You contract the disease. But in this particular situation, instead of him contracting the disease, the person with the disease contracts the healing. It's who he is. He's a healer. It's who God is. Jesus can point to those works. He can point to those acts of God, and he can say, that's who I am. Our God is a healer. These were things that were privy to everyone, that everyone got to see and that people would have talked about as they saw Jesus's ministry, right? We see these things in the ministry of Jesus. But as you and I get to look back, right, in retrospect, because hindsight is always 2020, there are two other things I see about the ministry of Jesus that I think are really important. The next one is that our God is a God who makes and keeps promises. He's a promise keeper. And you can trace throughout the entirety of the Old Testament and you can come across promise after promise after promise. You can see how God fulfills his promises. But I like to always just go back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter three, right? When after humanity rebels against God and sin and brokenness enter the world because of our rebellion, right? When it enters that God tells people, I'm gonna send someone who's going to make this right and it's gonna cost their life to do it. He makes that promise in Genesis chapter three. And what do we see in the person of Christ? We see that promise kept. Because Jesus, the consecrated one, as he says here, set apart, spotless, blameless, perfect, that he would hang on the cross for us in order to not just die the death we deserve, but overcome death by rise, rising from the grave on the third day. 
such that that promise would be kept in full. We can look to that and we can say, that's who God is. That's who Jesus is. He's a promise keeper. Fourth and final, we worship a God who is relationship seeking. One of the things as the religious leaders encountered Jesus, right, is they saw him going in and mingling with people who were kind of out on the margins, mingling with people that you and I or they might call sinners, right? And I just, if you look back at the entirety of, of, of God's word, if you look back at his earlier interactions with people, that every person God ever revealed himself to was always a sinner. In Genesis chapter 12, God engages in a relationship, seeks a relationship with this guy named Abram, who would become Abraham, right? Who'd become the father of the, of, 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 of the Hebrew nation. And he engages with this guy named Abram, who we know from Joshua 24, came from a house of idol worshipers. And he chose him, not perfect, not sinless. In fact, we know from, from later on, we know from the, I believe it's Hebrews, right? That, that we, we get to look at Abraham, Romans, we get to look at Abraham and we could say that he, his, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness, not as works that because of the God he trusted in. You fast forward a little bit, you see Moses, right? That God comes to Moses, reveals himself through the burning bush. What had happened before that? This Moses that the religious leaders loved so much. Well, when he was in Egypt, he came upon an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. He killed the Egyptian and he ran because he had just committed a crime. He was a wanted criminal, killer. And so what does God do? He goes up to that Moses and he seeks the relationship with this guy who will lead the people out of Egypt. And Moses' mistakes don't stop there. He's not allowed to go into the promised land because he messes up later as well. I'm talking about imperfect people. That our God throughout the Old Testament is a relationship seeker with broken baggage carrying people. And Jesus shows up on the scene and what does he do? He goes up to a, to a tree with a tax collector up there. My voice just cracked. Puberty was a long time ago, it happens. But he goes up to this tree. There's a tax collector up at the top. And he says to the tax collector, come down, I'm gonna dine with you. He could have dined with anybody, I'm gonna dine with you. That on multiple occasions, the, the religious leaders would see Jesus in a home with some of the unmentionables, right? Uh, doing their, the, the deplorables, so to speak, the marginalized, prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners. That Jesus would spend time with these people and they would look, how could he do such a thing? Does he know who they are? That's our God. You and me can look at that Jesus and point to that Jesus and say, that's who he is. That's who our God is. That the God that we worship and that the God we see in the person of Jesus is perfectly and unceasingly consistent. He doesn't change, all right? The theological word for that is immutable, which has nothing to do with the button on your remote, by the way. But that our God is consistent, creator, healer, promise keeper, relationship seeker, that he was so concerned, concerned for us, that God loved us so much that he would send his only begotten son, that he would have a restored relationship with us. That was the mission of Jesus when he came here. He didn't just dine with sinners, right? He hung on a cross to die for sinners so that any sinner who would put their trust in Jesus could live out the life and victory that Jesus purchased for us on the cross by dying the death we deserved. That's who our God is. And yet these Pharisees and religious leaders, they look and they don't see it. And Jesus says, look at my works, right? Now they hadn't seen the cross yet, but he can still say, look at my works. That's who I am. And believe, believe the works. And yet still, still the leaders have a recognition problem. Now, uh, there's this professional skater. He's a retired skater. His name's Tony Hawk, right? Many of you have probably heard of him. 
Tony Hawk, uh, as of late, has had a lot of fun over the last few years on his Twitter account. I'll get to that in a moment. Tony Hawk became very famous in the 90s in particular. Uh, he won uh, uh, over 70 uh, um, uh, skating competitions, two golds at the X Games. I grew up playing Tony Hawk Pro Skater on N64, so a little shout out to some other millennials who know what I'm talking about. Um, the thing that he's perhaps most famous for is being the first person to do a 900 on the vert, right? Where you go up a ramp on a skateboard, two and a half full spins, right? And then come down. Took him over 12 tries to hit that when he was going for it. So he's the very first person to do that. Now, over the last few years, Tony Hawk, like I said, he's had a lot of fun on his Twitter account because he keeps track of exchanges, encounters he has with people as he travels who think they know who he is or think they recognize him, right? And so you can go on, you can Google this. A lot of it's quite funny, right? But people will say, hey, has anybody ever told you you kind of look like Tony Hawk? All right? And he'll tell you about the exchange. All right, anybody ever tell you, you kind of look like a younger Tony Hawk, right? Are, are you that skater? Are you that? And he just kind of categorizes the exchanges. Now, there were a few that I found to be really interesting because they involved his driver's license and they involved TSA agents. And as you go and you look through these, he's had several of these exchanges where he shows up to a TSA agent and he hands them the ID and the TSA agent and, and multiple TSA agents on different occasions will say something to the effect of, oh, I, uh, are you that person? Are you that, wait, oh, wait a second. They look at his ID and it doesn't say Tony Hawk. It says Anthony Hawk and they miss it. Oh, you got the same last name. That's awesome. People who actually know who Tony Hawk is, right? See him and like, oh my God, you kind of look like that person. And they see the ID, but because it says Anthony Hawk, they miss it. They dismiss it. They're like, oh, almost, not quite. And for me, as I was reading through these, it's just really interesting that someone could know who Tony Hawk or kind of follow him from afar, right? And when they get him up close in person, when they see his ID, and when they finally get the revelation of the fullness of his name, to get a little spiritual and biblical, that all of a sudden he's unrecognizable. That something like three letters would change who they thought the person was. It's like, man, Jesus, all right, the progressive revelation of God, the fullness of God in the flesh comes makes manifest, right? Manifest in humanity, God in the flesh, we would say, dwelling among us, that Jesus, up close and personal, he doesn't have an ID, he's got all his works, right? But he's, he's revealing God to these people and he's up close and personal and that they would see and they just wouldn't get it. They'd miss it. I don't think it's just what Jesus was doing, right? I think it's also that the people had fixed themselves on the wrong thing, or at least an incomplete picture of who God was, so that when finally he was up close and personal, they missed it. I think they had a recognition problem. As I think about that for us today, I think it's easy, it's easy, right, that as a people, as we seek to be Bible-saturated, as we seek to be god fearing as we seek to be Christ exalting, right? And the way that we live, that at times we can miss it as well. And as I was thinking about, about the religious leaders during this week, I was like, what, what's the ingredient, right? You could probably think of many others, but what, what, was, what was the piece of the puzzle that, that was missing? What, 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 what was wrong, right? I was just meditating on that this week. And one of the things that really stuck out to me as I was spending time in the word is the word affection. I think the Pharisees saw a God who wanted obedience, and that's true. They saw a God who was to be feared, and that was true. Perhaps some of them even knew, knew the grace of God, right? And that's true. But I think at times, it, it was just very easy for them to miss the affection of God. Because as you look throughout the Old Testament, you don't just get a God who wants obedience, you get a God who is affectionate towards his people, who wants what's best for them, and who loves them dearly, his children. He doesn't just 
hold affection towards us, but, but that our response as people is to respond with affection towards him. That we're called not to just be obedient, right? And they were really good at, categor- or, or, uh, at obeying. They would tithe down to the littlest piece of their herbs. They're good at obeying. But do we see affection? Do we see a people affectionate towards their God? And when they see Jesus, God in the flesh, living out, doing all these amazing things, and we see an affectionate God as he loves and serves people, it just couldn't, it just couldn't fit with who they thought God was. And I think it's a caution to us, it's a warning to us as we go through John and as we see Jesus in all his encounters with these religious leaders, right? That as you and I seek to study the word to know who God is, and that's not a bad thing, I wanna know my wife better, right? Some people respond the opposite way and they say, no, 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 no. If I study the word and know too much, I'm gonna get all puffed up. No, 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 studying the word is great, but we study so that our affections for God would grow as our knowledge of God grows according to what he's revealed to us. And that we wouldn't lose sight of that. I think today during this time, coronavirus, some of you are at home a little bit more than usual, right? Some of you with your kids a little bit more than usual. Some of you have more idle time than usual, all right? And there, there's a chunk of you here and there like, what would that be like? But some of you, a little more idleness. Here's my question for you. What are you doing now aimed towards building affection? Time in the word, time with God, prayer. How are we stewarding that? Would we recognize God if he was in our face? Would we recognize Jesus if he was in our face? It's not just about what we know, right? It's about who we love and who we're loved by. We have to remember that. Some of you may be hearing this and for the first time you're thinking, that's, that's the God that I want. That's the God that I know loves me. That's the God that I want, right? That he's better than anything else this world has to offer. And if that's you, my, what I say to you this morning, that if Jesus is who you want, if Jesus who is the one that you're willing to put your trust in because he's a promise keeper and he won't let you down, then what it, what it takes is for you to go to God and say, Lord, I repent, I'm sorry, I turn to you, take over to receive and believe. There's nothing fancy about that but to turn to God, to receive and to believe, as we see earlier in the Gospel of John. I think, church, again, there's been a lot here today. So real quick, we're almost done. There's been a lot here. That Jesus is what he does. He does what he is. That God is perfectly and unceasingly consistent. And Jesus can look at his works and say, that's who I am. The close of this passage is this. So he departed across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing earlier and he remained there. Many came to him and said, John never did a sign, but everything John said about this man was true. And what, what? And many believed in him there. Do you see it? Do you believe it? You look at the works of God, and I think others can look at the works of God in you. We can see and point to that and say, that's who my God is. That's who my Jesus is. That's the power of the gospel. That's the self-giving love and the life-transforming grace of my God. Do you believe? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning. Lord, I ask your blessing upon everyone, Lord, as they go out this week. God, I pray for those who perhaps sense the Holy Spirit today, Lord, that they feel tugged at, God, that they need to give something to you this morning that maybe they've been holding tightly, God, that for those who are perhaps new to the faith, Lord, that you would make yourself clear to them. And I just wanna pray on behalf of all of those people, Lord, and they can pray with me, Lord, that we give you, Lord, we wanna give you all of who we are. We say sorry, God, for all the ways that we have betrayed and rebelled against you, Lord, we give you our sin. We confess that we are not worthy and yet you still died on the cross for us, Lord. So we love you, God, we believe, we believe. In Jesus' name, mighty and matchless name we pray, amen. We're gonna head over and close with one more.
worship song now. Let's worship. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in
Who you are, that is who you are.